Why don't we just begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious Lord Jesus, you promised to send to your church the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, uh, the Comforter, the Paraclete. So we beseech you even now to fulfill that promise and breathe out on us gathered here your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, to guide our, my words and our thoughts that only your truth would be heard and your, only your truth believed. Breathe out on us the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to strengthen us, to comfort us, especially on the journey of this day through the valley of the shadow of death and grief. Uh, and send your Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of life uh, and resurrection as well, that you would birth in us, uh, even in the midst of the sufferings and trials of this world, the Spirit of hope for the life of the world to come. And this we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I think I know a lot of you, but I just wanted to, first of all, just take an opportunity to introduce who I am. My name is Father Jürgen Leas. It's a strange name because I was uh, came to this country when I was uh, a refugee from Eastern Europe. My uh, father was a refugee from Estonia. That's the last name is Leas. And the first name, Jürgen, is a, Ger uh, a German name. It just means George, if that helps. All right. <laughs> uh, and uh, came to this country when I was four years old, settled in Charleston. Down. And uh, and I was not. I came here. I was a Lutheran, and we actually settled in the little Episcopal church in Charlestown by a wonderful old uh, celibate priest who had was taking refugees in. So I literally grew up in the rectory of a church, uh, oh, wow. uh, and uh, and really received my vocation. And you know, growing up under that sweet old priest uh, who made such a big impression on me as as a, as a little boy, and. Uh, <clears throat> Interesting enough, I was an Episcopal priest for 40 years, and then uh, a few years ago, uh, Pope Benedict established a special provision called uh, the uh, Ordinariate. It's, it, was, it was a term he used, the Anglican Ordinariate. It was a special provision to welcome Anglicans, or as you know them in this country, Episcopalians, uh, into the Catholic Church. and. Uh, and so I responded to this invitation. It was an invitation I couldn't refuse. Uh, uh, and I became a Catholic four years ago and then uh, applied for ordination. Even though I've been Episcopal priest, there was a provision to welcome me to become a Catholic priest if I was approved by the Pope. And there's only one particular unusual provision uh, only the Pope can uh, provide is uh, I, I was married. So, uh, and I still am married. Matter of fact, my wife and I just celebrated our 46th wedding anniversary uh, just last week. And so, so I waited a whole year, and then finally I got the word that Pope Benedict uh, had approved me for ordination. It was interesting. Uh, I had heard that I'd been approved for ordination, but the last feature was that only the Pope can dispense a priest from the vow of celibacy, so we had to get his signature. And the next, that's the week the Pope resigned, you know. <laughs> now, I don't know if there was any connection with his resignation and my approval for ordination, but, uh, but the, we had to scurry around to finally get my... Uh, the signature is called the rescript on a, a document. So somewhere in the file, archives of the Vatican is a piece of paper with my name on it and Pope Benedict's last official signature. You know, I, I think he was cleaning his desk off to get out of here. And said, so, uh, and then I was ordained by Cardinal O'Malley that uh, spring, and I am the pastor of a little church. Of, uh, we have a couple of my sheep here uh, who are former Anglicans who... Um, meet with me. We meet actually in the lower church where we had our service on Sunday morning. Uh, you always welcome the mass counts if you come to our mass. So uh, it is a legitimate Catholic mass, although it's a little bit different because uh, we gave a special permission to have kind of a hybrid version of a Catholic mass and an Anglican mass. But it is a Catholic mass, so you're always welcome to join us. Uh, and I've been privileged. This is the second time I've had the opportunity to do this uh, day of a retreat day, and, uh, and, and so uh, it's a special joy to be here. I want to begin by reading from Holy Scripture, from the book of Isaiah, 
And this is among the many wonderful visions, uh, particularly in Isaiah, but through many parts of the Old Testament, of, of uh, a, a new heaven and a new earth. And this is how it begins, chapter 65, verse six, uh, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall be remembered, no longer be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create re Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out all his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their children with them. Behold, uh, they, when they call, I will answer. When they speak, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The dust shall be the serpent's food. And they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Amen. I mentioned that I, I uh, you know, am married and I have two grown children and now three little beautiful granddaughters. Uh, um, and, but, you know, uh, I remember when, when I first brought my daughter home um, from the, uh, uh, well, still the Boston Lying In Hospital in Boston uh, in 1978, I remember bringing her home and just holding this little bundle in my arm. And I was standing, I remember, in my study in the rectory uh, where I was. I was a, a rector of the Episcopal Church in Malden at the time, down the street. And I just remember holding this little, Nejla is her name, this little bundle. And I suddenly became aware of this enormous abyss of potential pain that was there in my arms, you know? Uh, uh, this, this abyss of pain, potential pain, that wasn't there before, you know? Uh, I mean, we all face certain pains in our lives, but there was something about this sense of being vulnerable, if anything should ever happen to this little baby, uh, what enormous, enormous uh, a pain that would have. Now, praise God, through the grace of God, I haven't gone through that experience uh, yet. You never know what life can offer, but, um, um, but uh, I do commend all of you for coming today, uh, bringing that reality here, and, and, and I pray that, you know, it's a wonderful image, the road to Emmaus. If you know the story, uh, the disciples are completely brokenhearted and torn uh, asunder in their hearts by the grief of Jesus having died on the cross, uh, and so they're wandering in grief, and then Jesus appears to them, but they don't even recognize him. Uh, it takes a while for them to finally recognize him. But that's a wonderful image of the day that you will uh, know that Jesus is going with you and there'll be ways you don't recognize him, but he's there. And then there'll be ways that you will recognize him uh, 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 as you do. So uh, as I said, I myself have not personally had to go through that valley, but as a priest, I've gone through it many times with people. I'll never forget, I was a young priest, and the first um, funeral I had to do for a child was actually during the blizzard of 1978. Anyone old enough to remember that blizzard? Uh, and I, I remember I got a call from a funeral home that this couple had lost a baby from, through SIDS, the Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. So the child was a little boy, was about six months old, and died in the crib. And I visited with the family, and then the day of the funeral was chosen, and it happened to be the day the blizzard broke out, I remember. And I'll, I'll never forget that I, 
uh, we just had a graveside funeral, and it was just the undertaker, myself, and this couple, and this little, little tiny casket with the body of this little boy there. And the wind was howling, and the snow was blowing, and the bitter cold was like penetrating everything. And in a way, it was a, a, a picture of the reality of, of the death of a child, uh, this sort of bleak, frozen, cold, destructive sense of everything uh, that would, that, that would, uh, you couldn't, and, uh, and as I said, it was only two weeks earlier that I had brought my little girl home. It was, she was born just two weeks before that blizzard of 1978. Uh, and I can say, as a priest in my journeys of these 40, now 44 years, that I don't think there is any human experience that is as uh, painful as to go through the death of the loss of a child. Uh, uh, and uh, so again, I commend you for your courage in coming today in a way to revisit that pain uh, in the company of others, but also to be a gift and source of uh, life and hope for others. Given all that, I, what I wanted to do is say that out of these 44 years of priestly ministry, uh, there are three things that I think I've learned that I hope will be helpful to you today. Uh, and the first thing is that, and these are convictions of our faith as Christians and especially Catholic Christians. Uh, the first thing is that we live in a fallen world. You know, G.K. Chesterton, who's a great Catholic thinker, like me, a convert from Anglicanism to Catholicism, said that the fall is the one empirically, uh, uh, empirically verifiable Christian truth. Everybody knows there's something wrong with this world, you know. Even the rabid atheist who says there isn't a God, the reason he says there's no God because the world's a mess. <laughs> he usually blames it on God. That, it, that, that we live in a fallen world and absolutely nothing manifests that fallenness more than the death of children. That's why that passage uh, from Isaiah, now Isaiah is still the Old Testament. It doesn't quite yet have a vision of the resurrection, which we'll get to. But it did say that, you know, this vision of a new heaven and a new earth where children don't die, you know, where people live a long life into their hundreds and then fall asleep. I mean, it's, it's a limited vision, but it's still, you know, the way the world should be. I'll never, I'll never forget one time I was visiting uh, in a funeral home for a, a, a young man who had died, and his mother, who was a parishioner of mine, uh, as soon as I walk in the room, she starts screaming uh, at me, uh, sort of to me and at me, said, Father, it's not right, it's not right, it's, something's wrong. A mother should not have to bury her son, a son should bury her mother. Uh, yeah. And of course, she's right. It's not right. It's a, it's a manifestation of the disorder uh, of the fallenness and the brokenness of this world. Uh, you know, it's quite interesting, in, if you uh, look through the Bible, there are uh, seven resurrections from the dead. Uh, three of them are in the Old Testament and four of them are in the New Testament. Uh, and it's quite interesting, almost all of them are the resurrection of children. Elijah and Elisha, there's a little boy that dies, and they, uh, in each story, he raises him from the dead. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus raises Jairus' daughter and the son of, uh, of a widow. Uh, it's always raising children up. Because again, it's a manifestation of the kingdom. I mean, Jesus was about the business of proclaiming the kingdom of God and manifesting the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. <laughs> And nothing more defied the kingdom of God and the will of God than the death of children. So it's interesting that when Jesus raised the dead and the, and the miracles of the raising of the dead, they're always about children because uh, nothing is more uh, broken. We live in a, a, a broken world, uh, and that is one of the, uh, the most obvious manifestation of that fall. But um, so that's the first thing. Uh, and that's the reality of, of, of what we live in. 
But into that reality, we as Christians believe that into this fallen world, Christ comes and has come and brings to us, uh, you might say, some new information about how to deal with the reality. Uh, first of all, Christ comes into the world and he comes into our grief. You know, Isaiah says that Jesus Christ was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Uh, uh, the letter of Hebrews says that we do not have a great high priest who is unsympathetic, uh, but with groans and tears. Uh, uh, the, one of the things about the incarnation, what we believe that God became a human being, was God entered fully into the human experience, uh, and our experience, uh, and entered into uh, the depth of our experience, even at its most painful and its most worst. Uh, that Jesus Christ uh, came to us. It is, is, and, and the cross, of course, expresses that more than anything else. Uh, that, uh, you know, we as, particularly as Catholics, have, I assume there's a, there's, is there no crucifix in this I room? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's one that was put there. But you, I'm surprised. Usually every Catholic room has a crucifix in it. Uh, and it's so central that we, we have um, just this image of God that whatever we go through, there's a sense that it, it, the Bible says that Christ knows everything that we've gone through uh, and has gone to it. So that Christ comes into our grief uh, and into our, our suffering. But there's even more in the mystery of, uh, of the cross. It's itself the dynamic that you've experienced of a parent losing a child. It's not only Christ's sufferings, but in Christ, uh, in the Paschal Mystery, we have a father losing a son, our Heavenly Father. There's a wonderful painting, a very famous painting in uh, England of, the, of a crucifixion. But if you look at it very carefully, you see behind the picture of the crucifix this kind of shadowy figure, and it's the father. And as you look at it carefully, you see when the nails went through the hand of Jesus, they go into the hand of the Father. When the p spear pierced through the side of Jesus, it went through Christ into the heart of his Father. Uh, and we have it in this extraordinary image uh, in the Christian faith of a, literally a father who loses their son. And so we have a God who not only knows our suffering, uh, but also uh, has experienced in a very real way the suffering and the death of loss. And, and for we as Catholics, and this is really kind of a new thing for me as a former Protestant, not only do we have the, the sense of a God who has lost a son, but we have a mother who has lost a son. There's probably no more famous sculpture in the human race than Michelangelo's Pieta, which is, you know, there in the Vatican. This image of a mother holding the dead body of her son. Uh, uh, this, and, and one of the names of Mary that we have is Mary, the, the mother of sorrows. Uh, uh, so all of that in the Christian faith is that we have a God who is with us in all this, in every dimension of it, not a God who is absent from our pain, uh, uh, not a God who just looks far from above down on us pitiable people, but rather a God who enters fully, fully in every dimension into our grief, into our sorrow, into our tragedies of life. But <laughs> that's not the end of the story. Uh, in the death of Christ also points to the resurrection. Uh, St. Paul says that Christians grieve. It is, it, is, it is appropriate that we grieve. Our Lord wept, remember, at the grave of Lazarus. The shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. You know, two words. Uh, uh, but St. Paul says we grieve, but not as those without hope. One of the, obviously, the wonderful hope of the Christian faith is that death does not have the last word. 
I remember a priest saying one time um, um, the story of a woman who lost a child and said, uh, she was, you know, as the question you all asked, I'm sure, why did God take my child? Uh, and this priest very wisely said something. He said, God didn't take your child. Death took your child. But Jesus has taken your child away from death. Uh, I mean, we believe as Christians that death does not have the last word. That the evil of the world, uh, I love what St. Teresa of Avila says. She says, uh, the Bible speaks about the mystery of iniquity. There's no answer to why these, the, 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 there's evil in the world. Uh, you could, the philosophers have pondered that uh, for centuries, and I'll tell you, they have no answer. The answer, the answer we have, I remember Austin Farr, a great Anglican theologian, said, God did not send us an answer. He sent us a son. <laughs> And that in the death and resurrection of Jesus is the answer. And it is that Christ enters into fully the human situation in death, but he rises from the dead. Now back to St. Teresa of Avila, I got sidetracked. She said, the mystery of iniquity is one inch shorter than the mystery of God's love. Uh, and, that, and that, of course, is the proclamation we make as Christians, that in this fallen world, with all the tragedy that there is, uh, we proclaim through the resurrection that death does not have the last word. Uh, the resurrection is the whole cornerstone of the Christian faith. Jesus, uh, St. Paul says very unequivocally, quite boldly, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then our faith is futile, and we, Christians, of most Human beings are most to be pitied because we have followed a lie. That's what he says. He's rather blatant. If Christ did not rise from the dead, death wins. And that's all. But if he did rise from the dead, uh, there is a power and a hope and a victory over death. Uh, and we believe that. So in relationship to your children, what the Christian faith says, death is not the end. Uh, death is not the end. That it, we grieve, but not as those without hope, because our hope leads us to the hope of, uh, that you will see your children again. That your hope uh, is that they will be raised from the dead and are being raised from the dead and that they continue to live, and you will see them again. Uh, that's one of the central hopes of the Christian faith, and I hope it's a hope in the midst of all you've done that you can grasp yourself. And then, again, one of the things I've learned as, as, as a Catholic, and this is one of the wonderful things about the Catholic faith, which frankly is not very present in Protestantism, is not only do we believe, I mean, all Protestants also believe in the resurrection, but one of the things that's so strong in the Catholic Church is the communion of saints. And the communion of saints says not only that we will see those who've died again and live with them again, but they're actually alive now. And that we can have a continuing relationship with them. I love what C.S. Lewis says this so beautifully in, um, by the way, I think one of the best books on grief is his book called The Grief Observed, if you've never read it. He, uh, it was, he wrote that uh, when his wife died. Interesting enough, he wrote it anonymously. It was, more, it was a journal. He was just writing out his feelings as he went through the experience of the grief, uh, the loss of his wife, and, his, and it's rather... Uh, Raw, but I think most of you know what that's like, raw grief and how. But uh, at one point he uh, writes um, these words, which I think uh, I've always found very powerful. He, he's, he first talks about marriage and the dance of marriage between a man and a woman. And then he says, and then one or the other dies. And we think of this as love cut short like a dance stopped in mid-career, or a flower with its head unluckily snapped off, something truncated and therefore lacking its due shape. But I wonder if, as I can't help suspecting, 
The dead also feel the pains of separation, and this may be one of their purgatorial sufferings. Then for both lovers, and for all pairs of lovers without exception, bereavement is a universal and integral part of our experience of love. It is not a truncation of the process, but one of its phases. Not the interruption of the dance, but the next figure in the dance. We are taken out of ourselves by the loved one while she is here. Then comes the tragic figure of the dance in which we must learn to be still taken out of ourselves, though the bodily presence is withdrawn. To love the very her and not just fall back on loving our past or our memory or our sorrow or our relief from sorrow or our own love. That's a wonderful image. I don't, to think of all relation, I think it applies as certainly as much to our relationship to our children. Uh, love is a dance. Uh, it's a dance. You learn how to I've been married 46 years. I'm still learning new steps in this dance. Uh, uh, and the same with our children as they grow, you know. We learn how to, uh, the relationship, the dance of our relationship, our love with each other. But it's a wonderful thought that in death, the dance does not end. It's not over. But in fact, that you now just have to learn how to dance in a new way. Uh, and that's really what I think the challenge is and the hope and really the beauty of uh, the Christian faith that now the task for you is, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you already learned how to do this, I'm, I'm dancing with my children in a new way. Uh, and that can, for Catholic Christians, of course, one of the ways that the, the center of that dance is the Eucharist. I know. Uh, particularly since becoming a Catholic, although I had these feelings before as an Anglican. Uh, um, you know, my mother died just before I became a Catholic. It's funny, I have this theory that she got together with the, the Virgin Mary, uh, Heavenly Mother, and arranged for my final transition into the church. Uh, but, but uh, you know, just to sense every Mass, we come to that moment in the Mass where we remember the dead. And I always remember my mom and my other uh, you know, family, my father who died many years ago, but just have this sense of connection with them in a very real, real way. Uh, yeah. And so the Mass is one of those ways, but there can be many ways. Uh, uh, I don't know, as you think about the rituals, uh, I remember at our last uh, day of uh, Mass Day, a woman talking about that when she cooked certain things that she used to cook with her daughter, who, who died tragically in a car accident, she now remembers, uh, has a sense of cooking with her, uh, uh, obviously visiting the grave. Uh, there can be lots of ways that you continue to dance knowing that this person is not just a memory, but a living person. Uh, and then learning how to dance. As C.S. Lewis says, the body is missing in this dance. Uh, but finally, and that's part of the resurrection, the body, in the end, you will dance with not only the soul of the, your departed loved one, but the body as well. Uh, a perfected body, by the way. <laughs> that's what I love. St. Augustine says, in heaven, we will have the perfect body. And he goes on and on in the city of God saying, now if you were a little too plump in this world, you'll have a thinner body. If you were a little too short, you'll have a, a little taller body. Uh, and we will all have, I love what he says, we will all shine like the stars. We'll have a perfect tan or something like that. Uh, and he also says something interesting, we'll all be, you know what age he says our bodies will be in heaven? 33. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How would you like your 33-year-old body back? Huh? <laughs> well, you're going to get it. <laughs> uh, but that's part of our hope, that the dance uh, continues. Uh, and uh, so dance on, my brothers and sisters, dance on. The Lord of the dance, that's who he is. Okay, I think I'm finished with my thoughts, but maybe there'll be some response or questions uh, Thoughts? Uh, how much time do we have before? We still have a little time. Yes? I love to think of the story of Abraham 
and the sacrifice of his son, when God said to him, I don't ask this. I don't ask but this. then, when Jesus is on the cross, God doesn't stay. He gives. He gives. Them. It's um, the unbelievable scope of the love that God has. And, it, and of course, it's interesting, right, already in the story of Abraham is, is, is uh, um, the prophetic word, you know, on God himself, the ram, which is a symbol of Christ, is there. And, it, and remember, the mountain was God himself will provide the sacrifice. Uh, and the Christian tradition, particularly Catholic tradition, has always seen that, in fact, uh, that sacrifice of the ram was, was the prefigurement of the sacrament. A sacrifice of Christ. Matter of fact, on Mount Moriah, which is exactly where Christ, I don't know if you know that, that's, that's where Jerusalem was built, on Mount Moriah. So it's the same place where Abraham went 2,000 years earlier was the place Christ, God offered his son. Yeah. John? I'm not sure if you can find the perfected word in searching for St. Paul's statement, but which book is it? Which one? Which word? The one you said, prefer, perfected bodies. The perfected bodies? Yes. Oh, that's St. Augustine I was oh, speaking Saint about. Augustine. Yeah, okay. yeah. Right. And that's in the city of God. Yeah, he speculates. It's all speculation. You don't have to believe what he said. Uh, it's, his, <laughs> it's his speculation. <laughs> yes. Do you believe our children are still at work? Well, that's a good question. Now, the... the, the, uh, the uh, Scriptures, again, which give us clues of what heaven is, uh, at times speak a lot about rest, you know, that there's, there's a Sabbath rest and the heavenly rest. But then there are other passages that speak of our continuing to grow and work. Uh, and I've always found that also interesting. What, how be, that I, I, I think heaven is not a static place, you know. We sometimes have this image where floating around, listening to harps, and it looks, frankly, a little boring to me, frankly, you know. But rather, it's this dynamic of love. Uh, there's another great book, I don't know if you've ever read it, um, called uh, Sheldon Van Aken, it's called A Severe Mercy. I'd recommend that as a wonderful book about, that a lot has to do with grief. He, his, his wife died when he, they were quite young. And so that it's really a book about the experience of grief for him. A Severe Mercy is the name of it. And he has these wonderful images in the book about what heaven's like, you know. Uh, and, uh, and it's very dynamic, it's very active, uh, and it's very relational, of course, because God is love. Uh, uh, he has these uh, images of going for long walks with his wife, and because it's in eternity, it goes on, in a certain sense, forever. But then there's some, you know, uh, it's just a lot of rich uh, parts. Uh, and C.S. Lewis says, and I agree with him, that this life is just the front page of the book. You know, you know we think uh, time is short, eternity is long. Uh, and this sense of our relationships with each other. Uh, I'm always consoled by the words of St. Paul in Corinthians, that then we will understand even as we are fully understood. And I think of that in terms of relationships. Uh, I mean, I think of, again, my marriage, I mean, 46 years. I still don't understand my wife uh, after 46 years, but someday I will. Yeah. <laughs> or you may not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that sense of understanding and being fully understood, uh, of, uh, that, uh, yeah, where there's perfect love, which is in heaven. And, uh, and I know for some of you, there have been very difficult uh, aspects of relationship with your children, you know, where suicide, and, uh, addictions, and, uh, things like that, and, uh, and, and, and the hope of heaven, you know, is, is, is not only that there's no death and no addictions and uh, no sadness, uh, but, but this, the person that you love comes into the fullness of who they are, that God intended to be, uh, and that the person you know you've only, you, you might have seen glimmers in them of, of the best that God intended, but when you see them in heaven, they will be perfected, you know, uh, come into the fullness of who God really, really intended them to be. So that relationship will be really, 
again, not just something in the past, but very dynamic and very, very positive. Uh, yes? Uh, when I speak about my daughter's death, uh, I get angry when people say, well, it was God's will. Was it God's will? Well, yes and no. I mean, this is, this is the dilemma. In one sense, we believe uh, in, in a certain sense of the sovereignty of God, that God is over all things. Uh, yet, on the other hand, we believe that the world has fallen. And what it means is that there is um, a rebellious freedom in the universe. Uh, uh, and it's primordial. It's interesting. I mean, you know, we believe, for example, that long before human beings fell, angels fell. I mean, there was a, a rebellion in heaven with the devil. Uh, that we live in a fallen world. Uh, and this is one of the great paradoxes of the Christian faith, which people try to resolve, is the paradox between God's sovereignty and freedom. Um, uh, and, and, and it's another one of those things that you can't figure out intellectually, theologically. Um, um, so in that sense, uh, um, we believe I mean, it's one of these paradoxes, hard to figure, hard to explain. We do believe, and I think the time will come, that even the tragedy of your child's death, you will understand in a new way. That God, it's not so much that God did it, but God permitted it, and then God will use it for good. I believe that's part of the challenge in your lives, um, is even in this world uh, to see this, I call it spiritual alchemy, that in life God takes the worst things that happen and somehow turns them into good. And that is the mystery of redemption. That's the mystery of the cross itself. Uh, so, so one of the, um, the, in a way, one of the projects of tragedy in life, when evil comes into your life, like the loss of a child, uh, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? Can God in you turn this thing somehow into good? Or can one get stuck there and never, you know, I remember when I was again a young priest visiting a woman um, who was in my parish, but she never ever came to church. I remember visiting her. Her son died in Vietnam, and she was uh, stuck. She could not, she was still profoundly mad at God for letting her good son be killed in Vietnam. Uh, so she refused to go to church. It's, it's kind of interesting. She still had faith in God, but it was, you know, anger at God and real, real, uh, um, and, uh, you know, I visit her a number of times. I don't think I was a young priest. I probably said a lot of stupid things. I don't know. But to help someone take the experiences of evil in life and through the power of God, turn it into good. I mean, that is, uh, uh, I think, the, again, part of our Christian life is turning Good Fridays into Easter's. Uh, that's what God did with Christ, and in a way, that's not just true about him. It's about true for all of us. No one gets out of this world without suffering and tragedy breaking into their lives. Uh, the real challenge is how do we take the evil that comes into our lives and through the grace of God uh, turn it into good. And that's one of the wonderful things about so many of the saints. They really are models of the spiritual alchemy of turning evil into good. Uh, um, so it, I don't think I'm answering your question because there isn't an answer. Uh, um, um, and, uh, I also okay. feel, how can something so horrendous, how can something good occur from something so horrendous? Yeah, yeah. And I'm still trying okay. to find the good. Well, that's where we look at the cross. I mean, that's, in a sense, we have the model itself constantly before us in the, in the crucifix. This is, in a sense, the worst evil that, that you know, of, of God himself being murdered and tortured. Uh, uh, 
the, sin, the sinless one bearing the sins of the world and the sufferings of the world, and God permitted it, but then turned it into good in the resurrection. So, so maybe hold on to that little cross a lot, because okay. somehow in that, that, that's, for Christians, that's the answer. That's why the cross is, is a, somehow this, this is the mystery, the, we call it the Paschal mystery. This is the key. It doesn't answer the questions intellectually, but it's the spiritual key to unlock uh, the grace of God in these things. Yeah. If you said we all die and we carry the cross, we don't know what the cross is going to be for each of us. No. A few have escaped, right? Lazarus and a few others, but they eventually died? That's right. I would say Lazarus got a rotten deal. Yeah. I think dying <laughs> once is enough, all right? <laughs> So he had to do it twice. <laughs> so was the Virgin Mary the only one who was assumed into heaven, and that's the only one who escaped death? She died. She well, she died. died. She died, too. <laughs> okay, so what can we expect? Yeah, yeah. The only thing is, it's, there's a disproportionate amount of pain around the world, like Sarah and for others. Our son was able to escape with a fast death. Mm. Doesn't reduce the pain. No. No, nor, nor your pain as parents losing a child. And that's what I was trying to say at the, in the first place. It's not that God takes away the grief. He comes into it. And in one sense, your grief will always be with you. We grieve, but not as those without hope. I love what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says. When someone we love dies, there is a gap and a hole in our lives. But God does not fill the hole. He doesn't take it away. It stays there uh, until that person, them, you meet, you're with that person themselves again. Then that, it, it, it's, uh, um, I, I, I believe that that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of take the Pollyanna approach. You know, many people don't even make it out of the womb. Yeah. I've been lucky to live this long. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's coming. I, um, I just wanted to share a thought following up on our friend here. Um, one thing, like, I have such a great faith, and I always have, and I love hearing you talk. I, you know, I realize it's the, it's the truth, and I want to go there. Um, but for the five years since Matt died, it's almost six now, an awareness came to me that to be able to move to that level and to be able to um, see the good that comes out of the evil, I've really needed to open myself up and say, please, Lord, show me hmm. where you are with me. Please help me to see that this is happening. And he has. Hmm. And I think when you talk about being stuck, that in your grief, I, I have a feeling sometimes it's just a matter of going one step further and asking. Asking God, yeah. Because I believe that. I believe that God does turn evil into good. And, but you, if you aren't open to seeing it, you'll be stuck forever. Maybe Does that, that was, sense? yes, and, and that might be a, a wonderful way of, of, of thinking that first song we sang, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Love, right. Open the Eyes. It's, it's obviously, we're talking about a spiritual seeing of things right. that are in the natural level we don't see, but of seeing things spiritually, asking God to give you spiritual sight, and that, that in a way, makes real all the stuff I can talk till I'm blue in the face. It's just theology and philosophy or something, until our spiritual eyes open, we say, oh, this is real. You know? And that's, that's, I'm talking about even like seeing things in your kids, in yeah. your neighbor, I, I mean, I'm talking about real life experiences. That's right. And we'll share some of this later, but, you know, that all feeds into what you're yeah. saying, which was a beautiful talk. Thank you. Well, also part of the purpose today is precisely for those who, do, who have been in this journey, to, that, that's one of the graces of this ministry that you all have started, is that nobody can talk to you better than people 
yeah, who've been there. I mean, I can talk to some extent, but it's not the same as you can minister to one another today and share what you've learned and how to how to journey and to forward in this. I'd like to share with a fourth grade little boy who taught me in the CCD class a long time ago. His little sister had muscular dystrophy. And we were doing the Beatitudes, looking at the blessed attitude of looking at sorrow and everything. And little Johnny says, maybe I'm going to be a better person because my sister has that. I said, yes, Johnny, that's what the Beatitude is. And we went on with the class. And then he said, maybe somebody will walk by Leanne in the mall. And this person never said a prayer. But they would look at her and they would say, thank you, God, that I don't have. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. We don't know how God, and we, maybe we're never going to see it. But we've got to know what's happening. I've always had this image, one of the images of heaven is, is a little bit like the, the tag you have. Uh, I get to take long walks with Jesus and ask him lots of questions. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? All the mysteries of our lives. Uh, um, and I'm really looking forward to that afternoon in heaven. Uh, and I'm sure all of us will have those long walks with Christ where he begins to um, unfold the mystery of our own lives. Uh, and. Uh, all these things that, again, we perfectly understand, even as we are perfectly understood. Could I really Mary, briefly, yes. Briefly say that um, 17 years after the loss of my son, I'm here today um, to really look to God. Um, the concept of being stuck is um, I'm in cement. I have processed through a variety of different groups and readings and processing objectively yeah. and I'm in acute acute pain 17 years later and I came to the realization with the assistance of my daughter that I have to help. I need the spirituality to help me mm. out of my corner and I am faithful and I believe but I don't I feel my belief is rote. It was ingrained. It was taught. I've been programmed. I need to feel the truth. I need to have God come. Uh, it's very difficult to move alone. It's a feeling of being alone. Well, I'm so glad, again, you had the courage to come today. And we, that's our prayer today, that the Holy Spirit would do this work and begin to give you um, movement out, you know, to break up the cement and, and begin to experience being lifted up and being carried forward. Yeah. So that's certainly going to be a special prayer for that. Um, and I, I remember hearing someone reading an article once, that, and in it, it said that the death of a child to the believer is the most serious challenge to their faith. And I can't, those of you have been through this, uh, how, how could this, how could God, God allow this? You know, all those kinds of questions. But then he goes on to say, to the unbeliever, it's the most serious uh, challenge to faith. Is there, and that's a question, is there anything that's going to make sense out of this? Is there an answer? To that deep uh, question, um, and uh, and that's part of the journey. Because we believe there is an answer. Uh, there is an answer. Uh, again, not a philosophical answer, but the answer is Jesus Christ, and journeying with Him, both in this life and in the life to come, uh, because He is the resurrection and the life. He has conquered death. Uh, all of that. Let's stand with the Lord. Uh, thank you um, for this time together. Thank you again for your promise to send us the spirit of truth. So again, Lord, I pray you would glean uh, all the weeds out of anything I've said and allow just the uh, wheat of your word and the seed of your word to be planted in the hearts of your people here. Send 
your Holy Spirit, uh, the comforter, not only to comfort our hearts, but to open our hearts uh, that we may see. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.